Hi, welcome. There's the subject, and that's me, Dan Sachs, and let's just do it. The, um, with these back to basics talks, the dilemma is, you know, where do you start? You know, what is the baseline? And um, what assumptions are you allowed to make? And so I prefer not to make too many assumptions. And um, the consequence is that the early part of the talk, what I'm going to do is fly by a lot of basic stuff, which I think most of you know, just to make sure I didn't skip any of the foundational stuff. And then, uh, but what I would ask is that I don't want to lose anybody early on. So if you see something you want me to slow down, just yell, whoa, or something like that, nice and loud. And I will back up a slide. And the other thing is, it's very inefficient. There is a mic there, and we want everybody to hear the question. But if you yell it out, I will just repeat it back, and that may be more efficient than yours stepping over people to get to the mic. OK, the templates are a really big topic. You could easily spend a couple of days on templates. Uh, so what can we do productively in an hour? Um, what I'm going to try to do here is focus on two big things. What, is, what are the major features and some design rationale? Because uh, there's a lot of C++ which seems very arcane, but once you know the reasoning that led to these kinds of decisions, it makes a lot more sense. And so what I'm going to do is dip down into the detail just enough to clarify the big picture stuff and to alert you to some potential uh, problem areas and to point the way toward future study. So I'm going to start with a real basic example, a function swap that will take the value that's in i and put it in j and take what was in j and put it in i. This is something that you want to do for an awful lot of different data types, so it's a very good candidate for function overloading. And so there you have a couple of overloaded functions. One will swap a pair of ints, the other one will swap a pair of strings. And the way overload resolution works is that it has a best matching algorithm where it looks at the type of the arguments being passed in and says, oh, swap i, j, i and j are ints. Which one of those swaps will swap ints? And it picks the right one. If you swap strings, similar process happens, picks a different function. And if you give overload resolution something that doesn't make sense, like trying to swap a string with an integer, in this case, it will reject it. Now, it, in reality, op, uh, operator, I'm sorry, function overloading doesn't require an exact match of the operand type to the parameter types. It, it will try some conversions, but not in this case because the parameter types are references, and references are, are fairly unforgiving about what they will bind to. Now, when you look at the function definitions, again, most of us could crank something like this out pretty quickly on our own. There's the version for int, and there it is for swap. You produce it by copying, pasting, and editing. And after you've done this a couple of times, you say, okay, I get the idea there's got to be a better way. That um, for a straightforward function like this, your odds of making a severe editing mistake are pretty small, but the more the larger the function, the greater your chance of making a mistake. So we'd like an automated way to do it. And that's where, oh, by the way, for those of you who notice what happened to the, the move operations, I just say chill. You know, this is a back to basics talk. There were plenty of talks on move semantics. I don't want to cloud the picture with that discussion. This is still functionally correct. And there are plenty of other talks on move semantics. Um, so what function overloading does is it presents a nicer interface to the user. You don't have to know the name of a, a different name for each different swap. And so there's an ease of use there. The problem is that it doesn't spare you the effort of cranking out nearly identical functions one right after the other. That's where the, the tedium and the error prone activities creep in. And that's the primary motivation for function templates. So the thing to bear in mind is a function template is not really a function. It's a tool for cranking out functions. And uh, uh, more formally, what it is is it's a single declaration which can be used to crank out declarations when you know what type you want to apply it to. So here is 
the declaration for a template swap that will swap two things of some to-be-determined type T. That's no, it's known as a function template declaration. Now, that is enough information for the compiler to be able to compile a call on swap, but it's not enough information for the compiler to actually manufacture the function that does the swapping. For that, you need a function template definition. So with, with templates, just like with a lot of other constructs in C++, there's this distinction between a declaration, which just establishes it exists, and a definition which says, and here it really is. And in the case of a function template, see this is still not producing any code. This is just compile time information of a function or set of functions to be. By the way, in this context, when you use the less than and the greater than, they're known as angle brackets. Now, part of what makes it a little bit tricky talking precisely about templates is, in the case of a function template, there are actually two parameter lists. There's something known as the template parameter list and the function parameter list. The function parameter list is familiar to you. You've seen these in lots of other functions. It's the template parameter list that is the comparatively new thing. So what does that type name T represent? Well, T there is a placeholder for a type to be determined when you decide what it is that you want to swap. And the substitution of that type takes place purely at compile time. There's no runtime aspect to that. It's all compile time magic. The function parameters, in this case A and B, are analogous to uh, you know, function parameters in any non-template function. It's what gets passed when you actually make a call. But, and we used to be able to say in a very straightforward way that whatever gets passed to A and B gets passed at runtime. But no, we can't do it that simply anymore because of const expert and const eval, which will shift what used to be a runtime computation into being a compile time computation as well. So depending upon the context, if that swap function is being called in a const expert context, then it could be that that argument passing has, happens at compile time also. But if it's not a const expert context, then this would happen at runtime. Now, the type name T, the T in that thing, is essentially like a type def name. And like any other type name, it has a scope. And in this case, the scope begins when you say type name T, and it ends when you get to the close curly brace of the entire template declaration, or definition in this case. And by the way, there is a standard swap. It's in a header file called algorithm. And it's a member of namespace STD. It's one of umpteen different algorithms that are in the standard library. And by the way, it does use move semantics properly. But OK, so once again, a way of thinking about a function template is it's a recipe for generating functions. And, and the process is, to a large extent, very automatic. And there's a name for this process. It's, we call this template instantiation. You go to use the template, and the compiler figures out automatically, okay, what code has to be generated to support this thing in the running program? And so this is actually a, a process, just like we have parsing and code generation and linking. Template instantiation is part of the translation process. But and what do we call the result of that process? We call it an instantiated function, which a lot of people abbreviate to just call it an instantiation. Now, this is a little bit unfortunate. This is a classic example of where you have different subcultures in the industry using the same word for different purposes. Because in, in the object-oriented design world and in some other programming languages, they use the word instantiation as a way of talking about objects created from classes. And you'll notice that, for to a large extent, C++ programmers don't talk about object creation using the word instantiation. We try to reserve it for this process because this is confusing enough without munging those two concepts together. 
Okay, so how do you actually use one of these things? Well, the, mo the simplest and most straightforward way to do it is you just take the template name and you decide what kind of argument do I want to substitute for that placeholder? And you actually name the argument inside a set of angle brackets. So the name in this case, swap angle brackets in. That's the name of an instantiated function. That will trigger the magic chain of events that will produce a real function swap that will do the job of swapping i and j. And in fact, the way you can think of it is that at the moment in your code where you say swap int ij, the compiler says, okay, I'm going to instantiate a function and let's see if, I, if my pointer will work here. Yes? Oh, I, I usually just say you create an object. You, d you define an object, you, you allocate an object, you construct an object. You, we use phrasing like that to talk about the birth of an object, and we don't, and I say that, I just call it an object. You know, this class produced an object. Oh, the question was, if you don't use instantiation in the design sense, what do you say? And the answer is, there, there isn't really widespread uniform terminology in the C++ community for doing this. We just sort of wing it. OK. Um, so you can think of it as if, I guess there, there it is, right there. That is a declaration for a function that spawned from the template. And, and it happens right then when you go ahead and use the function. Similarly, if you later on you say swap string of s comma t, the compiler says, oh, swap is a template, I plug string in for type t, and I manufacture a function with that name and that parameter list. And in fact, if you build your program and produce you get the linker to produce a link map that shows where the generated code is. If this is a non-inline function, you'll actually see something that looks an awful lot like that in the physical layout of your program. Yes? The angle brackets you're referring to right here? Because that, because this function swap string is different from the function swap int. Those are two different functions, and they have to have a unique name. If you'll just hold on, I, I have more to say about the syntactic issues here, and I think you'll, you'll be a little happier after that. Okay, but thank you for, for chiming in. Yeah, so everybody, the question was, what's that angle bracket doing there? Is it really necessary? And in fact, it is there, it uniquely identifies the name, but um, I'm gonna get into the mechanics a, a little bit further along. And so on, you can use swap with another type argument, like a pointer to a constant character, and it will substitute it in the appropriate places, and so on, you get the idea. Does the compile, no. If, I gave a talk earlier on Monday about const, and go, go watch that. Uh, I happen to prefer east const, but you know, they mean the same thing. Uh, it's just, I, I didn't want to write two copies of it to placate both camps. You know, life is too short for that kind of stuff. Um, okay, now, another important insight is that the compiler doesn't instantiate duplicate copies unnecessarily. So for example, here, if I call swap string to swap strings s and t, that'll trigger an instantiation. If I then call swap string but with two different strings, there's no need to instantiate another function. They're both going to call the same function. But if I in, then try to swap two integers, that's a different function. It's passing arguments of a different type. You need a different function. So that'll trigger a different instantiation. 
Okay, a template can have more than one type parameter. In fact, there's a function very similar to this in the standard library. It's a, a searching algorithm that says, find everything from the first iterator to the second iterator looking for a value of type T. And, and what this says is that the collection of things that you're searching through is identified by a, an iterator type, a pointer-like type, and the value that you are searching for may be related to the iterators, but it can be a distinct type. So that there, there's no real bound on the number of template parameters that you can have, other than your ability to deal with it mentally. And once again, when you will instantiate the find function, you would have to provide type arguments for each of the type parameters, like that. Now, the keyword class is allowed in this context as an alternate to type name, and it means the same thing. In this place, in C++, whether you say class or type name there, the behavior is absolutely the same. But you can't use type name and class interchangeably in other contexts, like you can't declare a class widget using the keyword type name. Now, why is this? Well, when C++ introduced templates way back in the early 90s, the keyword type name didn't exist. And uh, Bjarne Strostrup had, a, I think, a justifiable aversion to inventing new keywords. So he tried to repurpose old keywords. And so class seemed to be the one that made most sense. Now, later on in this lecture, I'll explain a use for type name and after, that, that is distinct from this. And after you see it, you'll understand you know, why it's there. But the, the standards committee saw that and said, you know, type name is actually a better word in that place. How about if we just let you choose type name instead of class? And that's how it evolved to the way it is. Some people stylistically prefer class. I, I prefer type name in most settings. Now let's talk about class templates for a moment. Um, class template is a generalization of an object type. Again, just like a function template isn't a real function, a class template isn't a real class. It's a recipe for making classes. And uh, where, where there's a lot of similarity in the interface and the functionality of those classes. So let's just, here's a simple example. A class for rational numbers. A rational number is characterized by having a numerator and a denominator. It's an arithmetic type. And a good first order guess is to say, why don't I make the type of the numerator signed long integers? And so the class definition looks in part like that. Small sample of constructors. Those two, the plus equals, minus equals, are placeholders for a full set of arithmetic operations. And then down there in the private members, you have the representation of the rational as a long numerator and a long denominator. It's not hard to imagine, though, that other programmers might want to vary the precision of rational numbers. And if you didn't have class templates, you'd have to do a brute force copy and paste to crank out a bunch of classes with very similar code and just different precision. And all, again, all that copying and pasting is tedious and error prone. So what we do is we make a template out of it. In this case, the template type parameter T represents the precision of the, uh, the numerator and denominator in the rational number. Now, after I did this, I thought, you know, it would have, it would have been a good illustration. Maybe I should have made that type parameter named P instead of T or precision. And, but after many years of giving presentations and making last minute changes like that, I thought better of it, because I would almost certainly introduce a typo. Um, so I left it at T. Now, again, the compiler will automatically instantiate the class definition as needed when you go to use it. And that results in an instantiated class, which you also sometimes just call an instantiation. And the name of the class for, for example, rat, Rational long is simply the class name, rational, followed by angle bracketed long, or angle bracketed unsigned int. Whatever you want to substitute for the type parameter. And you can use the name of a class template instantiation 
anywhere that you can use any other type. So for example, here, I'm declaring an object RL, and its type is rational with long precision. If I get tired of typing out rational angle brackets long or whatever, I can type def it like this. You can use either the old style type def or the newer using uh, alias, the type alias, use the, the keyword using, either of those will work. And then after that, I can declare an object ri of type irat. And the compiler knows that that's a variable of the instantiated template type. Container classes, the things that make up the standard template library. A container is essentially any class that contains object of some other type. Things like array is a container, linked list is a container. And these things are really good candidates for turning into class templates, and sure enough, the standard library does that. There's, in addition to list vector set, there's multi-set, there's map, hash map, you know, quite, quite a large collection of these all implemented as templates with a type parameter representing the element type in the container. Whoops, that's interesting. I didn't mean to do that. Um, now, here's an example of, I'm declaring an object ratios whose type is a list where the elements in the list are themselves a type instantiated from a template. It's a list of rational with, with in precision. And note the space there between the two angle brackets, the two greater than signs. Um, in C++03, it turned out that if you remove that space, the compiler would misunderstand what's going on because it would think that thing is a shift operator. And it would not recognize it as a closing delimiter. Modern C++ has fixed that little annoyance by putting in a little lexical hack so that now you can remove the space and the compiler, based on context, will recognize, oh, that's two angle brackets. Now, once again, this is a class template definition. This establishes that the type exists. It shows you what the storage layout is through the data members that are there. But notice that it declares but does not define its member functions. Just as is common in many other classes, you can do this with a class template. So that means, what, what do you do about defining the member functions? Well, you can write them outside the class. Just like you can write member function definitions outside a non-templated class, you can do that here as well. <clears throat> now, so here's something important to note, though, that in a loose sense, a member function of a class is itself a template in the sense that if I instantiate rational for type int and I want to do a plus equals on integers, I have to instantiate that plus equals member function as well. And so if you're going to, to write the function template, the member, like in this case the constructor, is appearing outside the class definition itself, in a sense, that's a template too. The member of a template is, has to be instantiated as well. So, and remember that that type parameter up there, that T, goes out of scope right down there. So if you start muttering about T here without having restated that T is a type parameter, the compiler won't know what you're talking about. So you have to repeat the template type name T in front of the definition of a member. Notice that the, uh, the thing before the colon colon is rational angle bracket T, but the thing after the colon colon is just rational. Let's dwell on that for just a moment. Is that the way it is in C++ is that when you're inside the scope of a class definition, for the most part, you can use the word rational the identifier rational or rational angle bracket T interchangeably, one or the other, and they mean the same thing, when you're in the scope of the class definition and only in the scope of the class definition. So for example, if you write the class definition this way, notice the absence of the angle bracketed T's in the class definition. 
You can also write it like that. And these are equivalent. And, uh, and you can be capricious about it, but I would not encourage that to you know, randomly put it in or leave it out. The compiler won't complain. It's better style to do one or the other. But as with um, the member declaration, I should say definitions of non-templated classes, when you write the definition of a function like this operator plus right here, outside of the class definition, you have to proceed it by the class name. And it's when you pass that colon colon right there that you re-enter the scope of the class so that the return type here and the class name itself have to have the angle bracketed T. You can't leave it off there. But once you pass the colon colon, the angle bracketed T right here is optional. So you could write it like that. But to make matters more complicated, when you're doing constructors and destructors, the rule is you're not allowed to put the angle bracketed T after the name of the constructor or the name of, hello, there's a little bit of a lag here. Seem to have lost, wonder if I lost. Got to pause here for just a second for technical difficulties. Looks like I lost the, the uh, connection. And I don't have my machine here. So uh, the, can I have the, uh, oh, it came back? OK. All right. Yep, thank you. Um, so my recommendation is you don't want to have to memorize these special cases. I just say that. Whenever you're inside the scope of the class, just leave out the angle brackets. That's the easiest rule to follow. After, after the constructor and the destructor, when the name rational appears right after the colon colon, either because it's a constructor name or, yeah, you're gonna, it might also be a problem in a conversion operator as well. Okay, but you don't wanna know this. You know, you want a simple rule which you can live by, and the answer is just leave it out. Once you know that when you're inside the curly bracketed body of the class definition, or once you get past the colon colon, you're in the scope, and rational means rational angle bracket T. Okay, here's the way to simplify things, is just write the, the memory function definitions right there inside the class definition, and a lot of the syntactic complexity disappears. They look just like member function definitions in non-templated classes. Oh, and by the way, they, they acquire the implicit inline property when you do that. And a lot of people have gravitated to this approach simply because it eliminates a lot of overhead characters that you have to write with the repeated template type name T in order to get this stuff to glue together. A class template can have static data members. And when you do this, each instantiation of that class gadget, gadget int, gadget float, gadget of charstar, each one is gonna have its own counter. But just like with the member function declarations, that is not a definition for the counter. That's just a declaration for the counter. It doesn't actually allocate the storage for the counter. By the way, why is it that that thing is just a declaration? Think about this. If we typically put that kind of stuff into headers, if you take that, put it in a header, and you include it in several separately compiled files, and you compile each one, if that counter is a definition, you get a multiply defined symbol. The definition has to be somewhere else. Now, in C++ 17, they introduced the keyword inline, you can now have inline data as well as inline functions. And that permits you to actually put the definition there. And the compiler will actually figure out how to make one copy and throw away any possibility of duplicate instances. But that's a C++ 17 feature. And you always could have constant static data members defined in a class. 
that predates modern C++. But if you're not dealing with static constant members and you're using a dialect prior to C++17, then you have no choice but to write the static data member definition outside the class using a definition in that style. And notice that once again, it has to be template type name T in front of the static data member definition. Because in the same sense, a static data member of a class template is itself a template. When you instantiate gadget of int and you need the counter, you have to have a separate instantiation for the gadget int colon colon counter. You can have members that are types. This is very common in the standard library. For example, the standard list class, vector, dec, they all have a nested member called iterator. And if you write the definition of the iterator member outside of the list class template def definition, once again, you have to repeat the template type name T in front of it. Because remember, the T keeps going out of scope when you get to the closing angle brackets. When you wanna get back into the scope, you wanna say, now here's a member of something that was inside that class definition. You gotta say template type name T again. And once again, a lot of people simplify this by simply saying, oh, okay, I'll just put the entire member class, the member type inside the template and I don't have to worry about the repeated template type name T, and I don't have to worry about the colon colons. Life is simpler. When you use the member iterator, you have to fully qualify it. You can't just say iterator because it's a member of some class. In this case, it's a member of a class template. So you have to say something like list string colon colon iterator. And this is the way people wrote things 20 years ago. And it's examples like this that, that were a main motivation for the repurposing of the keyword auto as a type specifier in the introduction of range four to simplify those loops. That's the subject beyond what we can talk about, but the thing I wanted you to just retain is that you refer to the iterator member by outside the scope of the class, you have to refer to it by its fully qualified name. Now, I'm not gonna say much about friends other than to point you to a talk. Last year at this conference, I gave a talk called Making New Friends. It turns out that friend functions in class templates are actually very intricate. And I gave a full one hour talk last year just on that subject. So rather than try to squeeze a, that topic in here, I will just point you to that one. And in, in fact, it uses the same rational number class example to illustrate the point. I think having sat through this, you'll be able to get a fair amount of understanding about the complexities of friend functions in class templates from that talk. Now, a template argument can be an expression instead of just a type. Uh, so, for example, uh, there is a class template in the standard library bit set, which represents a set of n bits, a sequence, a fixed size sequence of bits. And when you instantiate the bit set class, you don't, you don't give a type as the argument. You don't say bit set int or bit set float or bit set char star. You just say bit set 32 or 128 or however many bits you want to be there. In the definition of the class template, when you write the, the template parameter list, you don't say type name here. Instead, you, you say what you want the type of that argument to be. You can say size t or you can say int. In fact, you can um, use a variety of types, including integral, enumeration types, pointer types, pointer to member types. All of those could be used as what is called a non-type parameter in in a template. Now we see these used less often than the type parameters, but they are used and, and they are valuable. They allow you to build constant values into a template at compile time. So for example, you could incorporate a fixed size buffer into a class by making the size of that buffer 
a compile time non-type argument to a template. Now, there's a little bit about the packaging here. Um, with non-templated classes and functions, we usually divide things, information up between headers and source files. Typically, you put declarations in headers, and you put the corresponding definitions in source files. Usually, the problem is you put definitions into header files. If you include them in more than one place, you get multiply defined entities. And that's not, though, the way we treat templates. Turns out with templates, you don't put anything in a source file. You pretty much put it in a header file. You, you put the class definition for something like the rational class in a header file, and you put all the member functions there as well, whether you intend them to be inline functions or not. It's all there in the header. Now, the consequence of that is that that information will then be included in, multiply, in multiple separate compiled source files, and the instantiations of the same thing could occur in multiple separately compiled units. You go to link, what happens? Well, normally, you think, oh, those are multiply defined symbols. C++ linkers are now smart enough to see what's going on, and essentially, they, they throw away all but one copy of the instantiation of a particular, like, swap int. Even if it's instantiated in two separate compilations, you link the program together and it'll throw away the duplicates and keep one copy of swap int that the entire program will use. Okay. <clears throat> I think this addresses the question about the angle brackets. It's that C++ often lets you omit the angle brackets from the function calls. So you can, the abs here represents a, an absolute value function. Absolute value is yet another function which makes sense for a wide variety of signed integer types. And you are allowed to call the abs function without providing the angle brackets. And what happens is the compiler will look at what's inside the parentheses and use that to deduce what was missing in the angle bracket. This is a process known as template argument deduction. Here's an example. We have our absolute value function, which will take the absolute value of some object of type t, and you can compute the absolute value of an int down here. And notice the no angle brackets provided, and the compiler figures out what was missing based on what's here in the parens. Same thing down here. f is of type float. The compiler will deduce that what's missing is the float. But the name of the function is still abs float. That's what's instantiated. It's just you're allowed to leave it out when you actually write the call. And what this does is it makes a function template look like an unbounded set of overloaded functions. It's a rule, in a sense, for manufacturing overloaded functions on demand. It, it, is it true for complex types or just for the primitive ones? I've got some examples. Let me just show you how powerful this is. So for example, we have our swap template, which I showed you earlier, which will swap two things passed by reference to t. And here we have swap i, j. Well, what are i and j? They're integers. Now swap wants to pass arguments by reference to t. What does t have to be in order for swap to be able to bind a reference to an int? It has to be an int. It's not much of a leap. And similarly, you can just say swap st, and it figures out what's missing is string. Or you can even do this, swap of p comma q, and it figures out what's missing is float star. Now, once again, if you pass in arguments, like here I try to say swap an integer with a string, well, there is no type t where you can have a reference to a t bind to both an int and a string. So in this case, deduction fails, and you get an error message. The compiler says, I can't figure out what's going on. Rethink what you want to write here. 
You can have a function template f that takes, in this case, an array of pointers to constant t's. And here I have an object which is an array of pointers to constant characters. And I try to call f of names. And, and the compiler is actually able to deduce that, the car, that everything else about this and this have the same structure. What I'm doing is I'm substituting char for t. Internal to the compiler, it actually doesn't match like that. Is this what you were wondering about? Yep. And so it figures out that the missing t was of type character. Here's one more. You can have a function sort that will sort a vector of type t. And here I have an object, which is a vector of strings, and I say sort names. And it deduces that the element type in the vector is string. Like that. Pretty potent stuff. Now, there are situations where the deduction just can't happen. For example, the deduction will only happen on function arguments, not on return type. So here we have a function f, which has an empty parameter list and a return type of t. And it won't deduce from the context that, oh, you want me to return an int there. That just, that won't work. You have to explicitly provide the angle bracketed int in order for that to compile. Now, um, here's just a few examples. Um, and I'll, that prior to C++ 17, argument deduction only worked for function templates. It didn't work for class templates. Here's an illustration. I have a couple of objects, R1 and R2, which are rationals with int precision. If I say swap R1 and R2, what will it deduce the type parameter to be? Oh, again, I screwed up a little here, I guess, uh, the, the timing on this is wrong. But, the, but for number one there, that's a valid call on swap of R1 comma R2. Um, it will deduce that R1 and R2 are both of type rational int, and that's the type being swapped. And in, on number two there, what I'm doing is I'm declaring an object R3 as a rational with integer precision. And what I want to do is initialize it by copying R2, which is also a rational with integer precision. Here's the thing that you couldn't do until recently. You couldn't say rational R4 and leave out the angle brackets on the type rational and say, oh, you want to initialize R4 with R1. What's the type of R1? Oh, it's a rational with int. Therefore, it must mean that you want R4 to be also be a rational int. C++ 11, C++ 14 wouldn't handle line three, but C++ 17 will. Okay, now let's talk about this alternate role for the keyword type name. Uh, you've seen it being used just to, in, in a parameter list to say, this T is a type to be determined when you instantiate the template. But here's the other use, and for this I need to back up a little and explain a little bit more about how templates are processed by the compiler. And it's this concept of what's known as two-phase translation. When the compiler is compiling source code, remember, for the most part, you take template definitions and you put them in header files. And we typically include the header files early in the source program so that the template definition, declarations and definitions will be visible when you start to use a thing down there. So as the compiler is reading through, it's going to encounter a template definition like that before the first use of the template. At that point, it doesn't know what T is. So what can it do? For, for the most part, it's not going to generate any code from it. It just basically scoops up all of that information in the template definition and puts it in the symbol table for later use. It just makes an, an entry in the symbol table for a function name foo with a template parameter t and a parameter list t of x and says, and I'll get back to you later once I need to instantiate something. So this is the first phase of translation. 
But what happened was, because the compiler didn't know very much about what T was, it was very hard to compile the stuff that was in the curly braced body of the function or class template. And so consequently, people would find that the compiler didn't do much analysis. And then when they'd later go to use the thing to instantiate it, they'd be getting error messages for things like missing semicolons or unbalanced parentheses. And, and the reaction among users was, you mean you couldn't tell me that up there? And the compiler's reaction initially was, no, I can't. And, but the, the standards committee said, well, maybe there's a way we can make it so that the compiler can do an awful lot of analysis on the definition of that template on the first reading, even if we don't know what T is. <clears throat> And so that's, that's the, the, the two phases that I'm talking about are that the first phase of translation is when the compiler just basically parses the template definition and squirrels it away in the symbol table. The second phase is when you actually go to use the template and plug in a type argument or a, a non-type argument to actually instantiate something. Then it has, the compiler has all the information it needs to actually instantiate something and fully compile it do a semantic analysis and code generation. And, and that second phase of translation will happen at every instantiation. Every new combination of arguments being passed to the template will trigger this second phase of translation. Now here's wh why this gets tricky though, is let's take an example like the standard string class. The standard string class has in it a member type called size type. It also has a member constant called nPos. It doesn't really matter for this discussion what they mean. You can go look it up when you look up the string class. But this is common in, in class templates to have member types and member constants like this. So now here's a problem. A make-believe function called munge. It, it's a munge function takes something of type T, where T is a template type parameter. And the munge function, though, doesn't return a T, it returns T's size type. So there's a presumption there that whatever size type is, it's a member of the class T. In fact, so this is a, a template that will only work if the type being used as the type argument is itself a class type with a member named size type. So if you pass in a class that doesn't satisfy this, it'll fail to compile. Similarly, nPos there is being used in the first line of the function body. And so again, this is a template which will only be compiled if the type T, whatever type is being substituted for T, has members size type and nPos. So that's a constraint on what types are acceptable as a type argument. So here's the problem. The compiler wants to validate that snippet of code, and it says, but I don't know what T is. I don't know whether or not T actually has a size type and an nPos. How can you expect me on that first reading to do very much analysis if I don't know that stuff? And here's why it really matters. Consider this. Look at that line right there. What is that? Think about that. What, what does that line mean? Well, I'll give you, suppose that, that size type is a type and nPos is a type. What does it mean? Think about that. Anybody got an answer? Here's what it is. It's a function declaration. What is it declaring? It's saying that i is the name of a function that takes a parameter of type t colon colon nPos and returns a pointer to a size type. Okay? What happens though if size type is a type and nPos is not a type? It's a constant, an object, or something else. Now what is that? Turns out it's an object definition. This says that i is an object of type pointer to size type. 
initialize. Those parentheses are not function parameters. Those are parentheses around an initializer, initialized with the value n plus. Yeah, that's actually a typo. It should have been a subtype t colon colon size type star, pointer to, not just that. What happens if size type and n pos are ten minutes? What happens if size type and n pos are not types? Both of them are not types. Then what is that? Turns out it's a multiply expression. It's not a declaration at all. And the left operand of the multiply is t colon colon size type, and the right operand is i parens t colon colon n pos, which could be a function call or it could be a function style cast. See, so this information about what's a type and what's not a type dramatically affects the interpretation of a line in the body of a template like that. And so um, there's a term for names like size type and n pos, which are preceded by t colon colon, where t is a template type parameter. We call this a dependent name. It means the meaning of the name won't really be known until we know what t is. We have to keep our options open. And by the way, names that are not dependent aren't independent names, they are non-dependent names. And non-dependent names have the same meaning in every template. They are not dependent on the type parameter. So here again is the problem. Compiler writers wanted to be able to satisfy users who wanted to be able to get error messages early, even before we knew what type T was. But the compiler comes back and says, but how can I do something meaningful if I don't know which of those dependent names are types and which of them are not? Because whether they're types or not turns out to determine whether something is an expression or a declaration. And so the solution to that problem was this. The standard added a line It said, a name used in a template declaration that is dependent on a template parameter is assumed not to name a type unless the name is qualified by the keyword type name. Here's what you gotta do. You gotta write it this way. That you say type name t colon colon size type. And what that tells the compiler is, obviously t is a type. It says so on the first line of the template. The question is, what's size type? The word type name there says, go ahead and assume that size type is a type. Go ahead and handle the first reading of the template as if you can be assured that size type is a type. Notice that there's no type name in front of t colon colon n pos. We want the compiler to assume that n pos is not a type. And that's the real use for the keyword type name in modern C++. Okay, now I actually have about seven minutes left. I, this is a stunt that I pull every so often where it's not really the end, I have a few more slides. That's my hedge against mistiming. So here's some important stuff. I'm gonna run over looking where by a, a couple minutes, but I think that you'll find that this is worthwhile. Um, now, I've been using the word instantiation. It turns out there's another word, specialization, and this is a poorly understood word. So I, I think it's important for you to to understand this. The real meaning of specialization is simply when you take a template and you take a combination of type arguments and pair them together, that's a specialization. So yeah, swap t is a generalization of swap, but swap int is a specialization that swaps integers. Swap float is a specialization that swaps floats. It's when you plug in a type and turn it into the name of a real function, that's a specialization. And everything that I've shown you so far, it's reasonable for you to conclude that every specialization leads to an instantiation. And that's not true, because I haven't told you the full story. By the way, the, the, the construct swap angle brackets int is known as a template ID, and that's the name of the, of the instantiated template. Now, everything that we've been doing so far relies on what's called automatic instantiation where you just go ahead 
and use the template and a miracle happens. The compiler just manufactures everything that you need. But it also means that you can't control where that generated code winds up. And um, this automatic process is great for most situations. Implicit instantiation leads to automatically generated code. But occasionally, you have to say, no, I'd like to place that generated code here or there. Like if you're working with DLLs or if you have issues with locality of reference where you want to make sure certain functions are in close proximity, you might want to control this stuff. And the way you do it is something called an explicit instantiation, where you actually write, here's an example of it. You can say template, and then you write the declaration of the swap string function that would have been instantiated, and that will actually tell the compiler, I want it to happen right here where I wrote it. It's not automatic anymore, you've switched on manual. And you can do this for any function. You can do this for classes, too. <clears throat> you can have the type deduction work here as well. You can, instead of saying template void swap string, you can actually leave out the angle bracketed int or string, whatever, and based on these types, the compiler will deduce what was missing from the angle brackets, and that's a convenience. But here's a problem, which is if you manually instantiate something, in one translation unit, what's happening in the other translation units? If they're automatically instantiation of the same template, are you gonna get conflicts? And the answer is yes. So what you have to do is actually turn it off in the other places. And the way you turn it off is by using an extern template declaration in the other separately compiled units. This is the price you pay for the manual control. By the way, this syntax is, a, is modern C++. It's not, it doesn't predate C++ 11. For function and class templates. Yes, it works for both. Um, now, here, yes. Go back to the previous slide, yes. It needs to, the question is, if I turn off the instantiation here, how am I gonna get code to work? And the answer is I gotta link it with somebody that's explicitly instantiated it. Okay, remember that I'm turning off the automatic process and going full manual here. There's, I don't believe you can mix automatic and manual in the same program. You're fully automatic or fully manual. Okay. Uh, what I want to show you here is that sometimes when you write a general template like this, it works great for a whole bunch of types. Like this is compute the larger of two integers. What this call on max here is going to instantiate the template here using int as the data type. But what about something like this where I have two arrays of characters and I compute the max of those? I think. A lot of people might say, well, doesn't it do an, a, a matching and, and pick whichever is alphabetically the greater than? It turns out Nancy is alphabetically greater than Dan because the, Nancy would, would occur later in a dictionary. But it turns out in this particular call, it will actually produce that Dan is greater because Dan is at the higher address. It turns out it's, like it's going to compare the pointers, not the contents of the strings. If you wanted to have a max that compared the contents of the strings, what you can do is an explicit specialization. And the syntax is to put template empty angle brackets in front of a declaration to do something like this. If max is already known to be a template, see the syntax only works if there's already an existing max template, you can then explicitly specialize the behavior of max for a particular data type like a pointer to a constant character. And that will, what the behavior is, that then when somebody invokes max, if it's max for any type other than pointer to character, it'll pick the general template. But if it matches that type, it'll pick the explicit specialization. And I, I want to make a point here about terminology. A lot of people will just call that a specialization. 
Not an explicit specialization, but a specialization and, and confusion ensues from that for reasons I'll show you in, in just a moment. Um, so anyway, let's just scroll ahead here. By the way, once again, the explicit angle bracket T is optional. And by the way, you use explicit specialization sparingly because it turns out you can get a better effect by just overloading a function named max to compete with the template. And this is often a simpler solution. Okay. So here, here's where I want to end up, is we have these terminology, which is explicit specialization is when you write a declaration of this form, a template angle brackets declaration. And what you're doing is you're saying, I want to take the general template and tailor it to work for a particular type argument. I don't want the general rule to apply. I want something that looks like the same interface, but it has a different behavior. That's an explicit specialization. But the concept in general of a specialization is it's any time you pair a template name with a type argument. And so here is a picture that I will leave you with, which is that, see, a specialization is just pairing the template with a particular type argument. Now, if you allow, the t if you explicitly specialize the template, then that specialization will be implemented by an explicit specialization. Like when I say max of, for, for character strings, I'm not going to instantiate a template from that specialization, I'm just going to use the explicit specialization. But if my specialization doesn't match an explicit specialization, then it will appeal to the template to do an instantiation. It's a subtle difference, but it's substantive. Because here's, here's what the bottom line, is that when you refer to this thing as a specialization, what you're saying is, I don't care whether it manufactures code from the, the template, it instantiates, or it uses an explicit specialization that's immaterial. But when you call that thing swap int and instantiation, you're saying, I know it wasn't explicitly specialized. And when you call it an explicit specialization, you're saying, I know it wasn't instantiated. See, the, the mechanics here are important because they, they, they elaborate your understanding of how the code was generated. Okay? And I'll just leave it at that. There were a couple more slides, but I'm really out of time, so there. This is where I dropped the mic if I could, but it's, it's under here. <laughs>